The means whereby, God gave fecundity to that virginal womb, are strikingly alike amongst the different nations of the world. Cast a glance over all the old religions and you will there find a sacred fire. But the fire was, for the Persians, the terrestrial emblem of the sun. And the sun himself was but the dwelling of the Most High, the glorious tent of the God of heaven. Note, the Persians suppose that the throne of God is in the sun, says Hanway, and hence their veneration for that star. The Hebrews, who shared in this belief, recognized the divine presence, or the Shekinah in the radiant cloud which overhung the cherubim of the mercy seat. They believed that God clothed himself with light as with a garment, when manifesting himself to men, on solemn occasions. It was the opinion of the synagogue, supported by the tradition of the temple, that in the midst of the wild rosebush, which burned without being consumed, when Moses, that great shepherd of men, was tending, on Mount Horeb, the flocks of his Arab father-in-law, there was seen a very lovely face, resembling nothing that is seen here below, and that this celestial image, clearer than the flame and more brilliant than the lightning, was, without doubt, the image of the eternal God. With this premise, it is not difficult to understand the drift of the opinion, so generally diffused, that a luminous ray was to impart fecundity to the womb of the favored virgin who was the expectation of all nations. With this graceful tradition of a pure virgin admitted to a divine union, surrounded by impenetrable mystery, was connected that of a savior God, born of her womb, who was to suffer and die for the salvation of the world. Note, this tradition is found in the sacred books of China. This tradition was not perpetuated, like the other, by means of brilliant and poetical images, but by terror, which makes an impression far more indelible than poetry. The bloody sacrifice, which we find established, from the earliest times, amongst nearly all nations, was solely intended to preserve amongst men the remembrance of the promised immolation of Calvary. This is easily proved. Worship, that demonstration of love, that homage of gratitude which Adam and Eve were to render to God immediately after their creation, was, in Eden, doubtless composed of only innocent prayers and oblations of fruits and flowers. But when they, ungrateful that they were, had infringed upon the precept, so easy in observance, which the Lord had imposed, like a sweet yoke upon them, merely to make them feel that they had a master, when they had lost, with the immortalizing fruits of the tree of life, their talisman against death, and descended from the charming hills of Eden to a land bristling with briars and thorns, to a land whose virgin bosom they must open to nourish themselves. Note, God might annex to the plants certain natural virtues for the sake of our bodies, and it is easy to believe that the fruit of the tree of life had the virtue of restoring the body, by an element so proportionate and so efficacious that none could ever die while using it. Man was never immortal in this world as the pure spirits are, for a body formed of dust must needs return to dust. He was so, only by a favor, without precedent, and conditionally granted, whereby he was elevated to, and maintained in, a position far above his proper sphere. Immortality here below, never yet belonged to man as a birthright. Every earthly body is to perish through the dissolution of its parts, unless prevented by a special decree of the Creator. This divine will, was manifested in favor of our first parents. God planted, in the delicious garden where he had placed mortal man, the tree of life, a plant of celestial origin, which had the property of repelling death, as the laurel, according to the ancients, keeps off the thunder. To that mysterious tree was attached the immortality of the human species. Away from that protecting tree, death again seized his prey, and man was hurled from the height of heaven, into his miserable tenement of clay. No one will question, I fancy, that God had an undoubted right to expel Adam from the garden after his disobedience, but the expulsion involved the sentence of death for man and his posterity. Without the tree of life, he was nothing more than a frail and perishable creature, subject to the laws which govern created bodies, when the antidote is wanting, it is very evident that the poison kills. Having again become mortal, Adam begot sons mortal like himself. The condition into which the father had fallen must needs be that of the children. In that, God did no wrong to the human race. We are, by nature, mortal. He has left us as we were. 
to withdraw a gratuitous favor, when the object of that favor tears, with his own hands, the deed of gift, is assuredly not severity, but only justice. They added to the fruits and wild flowers produced by the land of exile, the first fruits of their flocks. This merits attention. Adam, who joined to the perfection of the human form an intelligent and elevated mind, wherein the Lord had planted the germ of all virtue and of all knowledge, could not be void of humanity. His fatal complaisance to Eve shows him loving even to weakness, and therefore susceptible, in the highest degree, of all kindly feelings and affections. How could it, then, occur to him that the Creator would take pleasure in the violent death of his creature, or that an act of destruction was an act of piety? The immolation of animals, which has not the slightest connection with the vows and prayers of man, and which the purely vegetable food of the first patriarchs left without other object than that of murder, must needs have excited a thousand feelings of disgust and repugnance in the mind of our common father. Long had those, poor, dumb creatures, devoid of reason, but very capable of attachment, composed, in Eden, the court of that solitary king. He then seated himself at the same table, slept on the same mossy hillock, quenched his thirst at the same spring, and his prayer ascended to heaven, at early dawn and evenings close, with the warbling of the birds, who seemed to sing, in their turn, the morning or evening hymn. Those companions of his happier days, involved in his misfortune, now shared his exile. Note, the time that Adam and Eve remained in the terrestrial paradise is not exactly known. It must, nevertheless, have been of some duration, and so it was understood by Milton, whom we do not here quote as a poet, but as a profound oriental scholar. Moreover, if we remember that it was in Eden, that Adam learned to distinguish and to call by name all the birds of the air, the beasts of the earth, and the fishes of the water, that he there learned the virtues of plants, and what God chose to teach him regarding the course of the stars. We must then conclude that all this was not the work of a day. The Persians and the Chinese have it that the first man was in paradise for many ages. The Arabs and the Rabbins say that he was there only half a day, but, according to them, that half day in paradise was equivalent to 500 years, for a day there was equal to a thousand years. According to our views, that period of time is much too long. It is commonly believed that Cain, whose birth in Genesis follows closely upon the expulsion of his parents, was born in the year of the world 13, which would leave the stay in paradise in or about 12 years. That term, although somewhat short, would have, nevertheless, enabled the first man to establish his supremacy over the animals subject to him, and to attach him to his humble dependence by the tie of habit. Some, giving way to the ferocious instinct which in paradise had remained undeveloped, fled to the depth of the wilderness or the secret caverns of the mountains, whence they soon waged deadly warfare against their former master. Others, mild and inoffensive by nature, established themselves around the grotto of their lord, to whom they offered, to satisfy his wants and soothe his cares, their milk, their labor, their fleece, and their melodies concerts. Well, it was from the ranks, thin they were, too, of these humble friends, faithful in misfortune, that Adam selected, counted, and marked his victims. It was into the throat of the heifer who had given him milk, of the dove who had flown to his bosom for shelter when the vulture hovered in the air, of the lamb that quitted its flowery pasture to lick his hand, that he had the heart to plunge his knife. Ah, when man, yet unpractised in killing, struck down at his feet, a poor, timid creature, and saw it bleeding and struggling in the agony of death, he must have stood pale and horror-stricken, like the assassin who has just committed his first murder. That thought never occurred to him. It was not an act of choice, but of painful obedience. Who imposed it upon him? He to whom alone it belongs to dispose of life and death, God. Adam committed a sin so enormous by its aggravating circumstances and its disastrous consequences, that, in order to express its full extent, the Hebrew tradition relates that the sun hid his face in horror. Note, it is in remembrance of the sin of Eve, at sight of which, according to the Jews, the sun hid his light, that the Jewish women are specially charged to light the lamps which burn in every house during the Sabbath night. It is just, say the Hebrew doctors, 
that women should rekindle the flame which they have extinguished, and that they be charged with that trouble, in expiation of their sin. Satan attacked him in his strength, at a time when, as yet, he knew naught but good. In the fairest of earth's scenes, under the recent impression of the immense benefit of creation, free, happy, tranquil, immortal, and capable of resisting if he had chosen to do so. It was from this height that he fell into the fearful abyss of disobedience and ingratitude.